To help us begin the discussion, debate, and reflection on our topic, I would like to introduce our first keynote speaker, the Honorable Richard A. Clark. Mr. Clark is an internationally recognized expert on homeland security, national security, cybersecurity, and counterterrorism. He's currently a consultant for ABC News, teaches at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, and is a partner with Good Harbor Consulting. Mr. Clark served the last three presidents for an unprecedented 11 consecutive years as a senior White House advisor. He also served in the State Department as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and the Assistant Secretary for Political Military Affairs. In 2010, Foreign Policy Magazine chose Mr. Clark as one of the top 100 global thinkers. Back in the fall, when our fellows began their journey of study, research, and discussion, the very first book they read and debated was Mr. Clark's Cyber War, The Next Threat to National Security and What to Do About It, a superb primer on the subject. We are very fortunate to have Mr. Clark with us this morning. Please join me in giving Mr. Clark a warm welcome. Yeah, good morning and thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. I'm probably the wrong guy to give a morning keynote, um, especially on a gray day, because I'm not a morning person at all. I operate in the fog until about 11 o'clock. Um, and on days like this, it probably extends past noon. But in the fog of uh, trying to wake up this morning and shave, I thought I heard people talking to me about cybersecurity. Now, I spend a lot of time thinking about cybersecurity, but I haven't heard voices yet. Uh, but as I was shaving this morning, NPR began, began the 6 o'clock broadcast uh, by talking about Iran and the threat of cyber warfare from Iran to us, not the other way around. And then about five minutes into the broadcast, they began talking about cyber security legislation uh, that the Admiral has made reference to working its way through Congress. And I thought, my God, cyber security leading the broadcast at six o'clock in the morning. And here I am going to a conference on the ethics of cyber warfare. 15 years ago, when we uh, tried to get the Pentagon to take the annual eligible receiver conference, uh, eligible receiver exercise, which was, as some of you may remember, a no-notice uh, JCS exercise every year. When we tried in 1997 to get the JCS to agree that eligible receiver should be a cyber exercise, well, let's just say there were a few people who said, a what? A cyber exercise? What are you talking about? If I had tried even 10 years ago uh, to get this many people into the room, into a room to talk about cyber warfare, uh, I would have failed. And in fact, I did uh, many times. So it's, it's very rewarding to see uh, that the Academy is now requiring uh, cybersecurity as part of the curriculum. And very rewarding to see that an institution like this is focusing on the issue of cyber warfare. And very rewarding to see that it's getting down to the detail of talking about cyber warfare and ethics. I'm not going to talk about ethics. I think it's the job of the, the kickoff keynote speaker to do two things. One, to wake you up, which I will probably fail with doing. Uh, and two, to provide you the context in which the experts can discuss the details. And the experts uh, on ethics and law certainly do not include me. So let me instead try to provide for you the broader context in which cybersecurity uh, should, I think, be viewed and currently, currently is being viewed. And I'll focus on two kinds of context. Uh, one, what's going on today in cyberspace? What's really going on? What's, what is the reality against which the theory should be applied? And secondly, what's going on in Congress? What is going on to shape the legislative and legal framework uh, in which we will be operating when we deal with cybersecurity? 
So let me talk first about the context in cyberspace. Uh, and to make this something that you can maybe uh, recall after lunch, uh, let me give you uh, an easy way to think about what I'm going to say. There are four things, four separate things going on in cyberspace, and we tend all too often, particularly in the media, to jumble them all up into one thing. So remember them as four things, and remember that by using the word CHEW, C-H-E-W. There are four things, and they all relate to CHEW. The first is the C in CHEW, and that's crime. There is an enormous amount of crime going on in cyberspace. This wasn't true 15 years ago. Uh, it wasn't true that this level of crime, this volume of crime, was going on even five years ago. We're talking about multi-billion dollar crime cartels. The US Treasury Department said last year that the crime cartels, the cyberspace crime cartels, in aggregate, are making more money than the drug cartels. Does that give you some idea of the nature and size of the problem? Now, drug cartels are colorful. Their leaders have colorful names. They kill each other. They behead people. There are body bags, all the kinds of things that the media love. And frankly, all the kinds of things that intelligence agencies love. Uh, and so there's a lot of focus in the government and has been for a long time on narcotics crime but much less on cybercrime, in part because it's silent, in part because it doesn't appear to create body bags, although it enriches some very nasty people, and in part because we really don't know what to do about it. Cybercrime largely comes at us in the United States from cyber sanctuaries. Cyber sanctuaries in the former Soviet Union, cyber sanctuaries in places like China, where the governments are, if not complicit, uh, at least willing to turn a blind eye. Uh, I had an uh, East European intelligence chief attend a class uh, at Harvard, uh, and I talked about the cyber criminals and the sanctuaries. And he came up to me after the class and he said, you know, you're absolutely right. You can't trust these guys. I said, really? He said, yeah, I thought I had to deal with them that they wouldn't hack in my country if I just let them hack you over here. Yeah, cyber sanctuaries. And we're talking about billions of dollars. One estimate that came out only yesterday uh, put the Russian cyber crime take last year, just the Russian cyber crime take, uh, at between two and three billion dollars. And that was about 25% of the cyber crime overall, not counting, and this is the footnote I love, you always got to read the footnotes. The footnote said, not counting activities directed at banks. <laughs> so we're talking about big business here. And that is primarily uh, what is going on in cyberspace. The second letter of CHU is H, and that stands for hacktivism. We have, for the last two years at least, uh, seen through WikiLeaks and uh, Anonymous and the various spin-offs of Anonymous, a new kind of coordinated and significant activity, not motivated by money, uh, not motivated by any of the traditional things that we've seen before in cyberspace, but instead merely political statement. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say merely political statement. Political statement. Uh, and that has resulted in, among other things, the leak of thousands uh, of classified U.S. documents, which uh, I know from personal experience has made it more difficult for U.S. diplomats to do the kinds of things that they need to do to protect American lives uh, and to conduct the war on terrorism. Uh, hacktivism continues today, uh, although somewhat at a lower level, because it turned out the hacktivists weren't all that good, many of them. Uh, and the result of that was that they could be traced, and many of them have therefore been arrested. Uh, but hacktivism does continue. 
The third letter in CHU is E, and that's espionage. Industrial espionage, corporate espionage, espionage aimed at governments as well. But I think the chief problem here is not the espionage aimed at governments, but the espionage aimed at private corporations. Uh, there's a quote which is going around in Washington, and there are three or four people who claim to have originated it. I'm not one of them. Uh, and that quote is that cyber espionage represents the greatest transfer of knowledge and wealth in history. American companies, and companies in Europe and Asia, but mainly American companies, have spent billions of dollars, taxpayer dollars, stockholder dollars, on research and development, on development of manufacturing processes, uh, things that are competitive, that make them successful as companies, the secret sauce uh, of American companies, and U.S. national laboratories. Uh, and that information has already been exfiltrated by the terabyte and petabyte to China. The next statement is one that I made and has now been picked up by a lot of other people, so, but I'll stand behind this one. Every major company in the United States has already been penetrated and its secret sauce stolen. Every major company. Not an exaggeration. If you don't believe me, talk to the FBI. Sean Henry, the former head of cyber crime at the FBI, who's now left the FBI, said the same thing. Now that he's out, he can say it. It's great, by the way. Uh, for those of you who are still in the military or government, it is very liberating to leave it, let me tell you, um, <clears throat> because you no longer have to clear your remarks. Well, technically you do, but you don't really. Uh, and Sean Henry, having been out of the FBI now for uh, a month, I think, testified yesterday, uh, two days ago, before a congressional committee, and said the same thing. Every major company in the United States has been penetrated. And that doesn't just mean the Lockheed Martins, although that's one of them, or the Booz Allens, although that's one of them, uh, in the intelligence and military business, but it also means uh, financial institutions like Citibank. Uh, it means manufacturing companies that uh, are in the chemical industry, petroleum industry. In addition to proprietary information, chemical formulas and engineering diagrams, it's also transactional information. Uh, what are the plans for new products? When are they coming out? How much are they going to charge? What are the customer lists? Everything that has any value to a competitor. And this is happening in companies that are spending millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars on cybersecurity. I thought that, that was an exaggeration. I talked to one company uh, that is spending over $100 million a year on cybersecurity and was completely penetrated. Firewalls don't stop it. Antivirus doesn't stop it. Intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems, personal authentication doesn't stop it. Certificates don't stop it. All of the first generation cybersecurity hardware and software fails before the kinds of advanced persistent threats that are being used to take this information. Now, people like to say in the, in the Pentagon, people like to say that that's happening in the industrial space, but certainly not happening in the Pentagon. Okay. Um, for those of you who believe that, uh, A, I have a bridge to sell you, uh, and B, I have two words for you to Google Buckshot Yankee. I see blank stares generally. All right, so you'll have to Google it. But trust me, if you think that the classified networks can't be penetrated, uh, that's not the case. The fourth letter in CHU is W. Uh, and that stands for Cyber War, which is the focus of your discussion today. When my book, Cyber War, was written three years ago uh, and came out, there was a lot of skepticism. Uh, and people said, well, you can't give us an example, really, uh, of physical destruction in the real world 
that has been occasioned by a cyber attack. Uh, you can talk about, oh, the, the Russians got mad at Estonia, uh, and they made life difficult for Estonia for a while in 2007, and the Russians got mad at the nation of Georgia in 2008. And they made life difficult for them for a while. But you're talking in your book about destruction, damage, and disruption. Show me where that has occurred. Well, Natanz. That's where it's occurred. Natanz, the home of the Iranian nuclear enrichment processing, was attacked by a cyber war attack. 1,000 nuclear centrifuges were physically destroyed and taken offline and taken out of the building, according to the IAEA inspectors. 1,000 of the centrifuges physically destroyed by a cyber attack. So when you reflect on that check you wrote on April 15th to Uncle Sam, remember, sometimes your taxpayer dollars do good work. It is clear that you can take over digital control systems remotely. Uh, it is clear that you can cause them to do things that they should not do. Iran this week uh, convened its cyber crisis committee. At least that's what they said in their news announcement. So now we know Iran has a cyber crisis committee. They did so because there was another attempt this week to take over digital control systems in Iran, this time to take over the digital control systems of Karg Island uh, and the offshore oil platforms. Wonder who could have done that. Warfare in cyberspace is not a myth. Uh, it is something that could happen. And people who doubt that uh, should look at what about two dozen militaries have done around the world. Uh, about two dozen militaries have created offensive cyber commands. Uh, the United States is not the only one. We may have the largest. Uh, we may have had the first. But there are about two dozen now uh, offensive cyber commands. Uh, that is not because it's a myth. Uh, it's because a lot of countries have realized that it can, in fact, be done. Their capabilities vary enormously, uh, from the United States probably being the most capable, the United States and Russia, uh, down to uh, countries that have offensive warfare units that are a little primitive, but nonetheless they have them, uh, like North Korea, uh, whose offensive cyber warriors have to go out of the country to conduct warfare because the bandwidth in the country is not very good. So that is the context in cyberspace. A lot of activity going on by criminals making money, a lot of activity going on by governments stealing intellectual property, stealing research and development information, uh, and some activity by hacktivists making noise in the system, uh, a lot of preparatory activity by governments preparing to conduct cyber war. I don't believe that any nation state is going to conduct cyber war, however, just because it got a new weapon. Nations tend not, and I have searched for a historical example, I can't find an example of nations going to war just because they got a new weapon and wanted to try it out. Uh, I think it is likely that nation states will use cyber war when and if uh, they decide to go to war anyway. Which brings us back to the discussion on NPR this morning about Iran. Uh, if the United States ended up bombing Iran, a scenario which is not unrealistic, uh, if Israel starts it, uh, we can imagine Iran uh, retaliating in every way that it can against the United States. And an Iranian cyber attack on the United States, therefore, is not a crazy idea. Uh, there are a lot of people who think that the probability of an Israeli attack on Iran sometime between now and November uh, is relatively high. 
Uh, and if that happens, the probability of the United States getting sucked into a conflict out there would be even higher. Uh, and if that's the case, if the United States drops iron uh, on Iran, you can imagine a cyber attack, uh, if Iran can mount one, a cyber attack on the United States. And the United States has almost no capability to defend the likely targets. No plans, no capability, no system to defend the likely targets. Because the likely targets are not military. The likely targets are civilian. That brings us to the second context that I want to discuss today. And that second context is the legislative context. There are half a dozen bills floating around uh, in the Congress, which is good. The Congress has woken up and focused on this issue. What's bad is that they don't appear likely to pass any of them. Three issues, well, they'll pass one House perhaps, but getting two House passage uh, seems difficult. Three issues have emerged in this legislative debate. Uh, two of them uh, involve Senator McCain, so it's appropriate we discuss them at the McCain conference. The first, which does not uh, involve the senator, uh, is privacy. The, the House uh, appears ready to pass a bill coming out of the Intelligence Committee uh, that will allow for the exchange of information between the private sector, between and among the private sector, within the private sector, and from the private sector to the government. Information about cyber attacks. Now, that seems straightforward. Seems like something we'd all be in favor of. Uh, want information about cyber attacks. Certainly, if the private sector companies have that information, we'd like the government to get it so it can analyze it. But the White House, uh, as the Admiral mentioned, issued a veto threat yesterday uh, on that bill. Veto threats from the White House are very rare. Uh, and the fact that the White House itself issued it yesterday uh, is, is noteworthy. The reason they did was that the bill has been sloppily drafted. Uh, and the bill provides almost no legal protections uh, for consumers. It provides almost no legal protection for companies. Uh, and it, it could easily be abused uh, to monitor email traffic uh, and to reveal privacy information currently protected by federal law. Uh, so the sponsors of the legislation say uh, that they have a series of amendments, perfecting amendments, I love that term, perfecting amendments, they're going to make it perfect. Um, perfecting amendments which they will be introducing later this week. But what that debate reveals is a fundamental issue which the administration, Congress hasn't really been able to deal with properly. And that fundamental issue is the fear of a lot of people in this country on the left and the right. And it's very unusual because you're getting the, the organizations uh, like the ACLU uh, cooperating with organizations uh, and others on the right. The, the, the lead critic of this bill, it turns out, is Ron Paul. It's not someone I typically think of as being on the left. Um, fearing big brother government. Fearing that government, once it's given authority, somewhere, someone in the government will abuse that authority. And based on past practice, that's probably a legitimate fear. Uh, so, what I hope is in their perfecting amendments, and what we certainly need, uh, is to have a privacy and civil liberties oversight board that is robust, uh, that is independent, that has subpoena authority and inspector general authority, that can look at the government's performance not only uh, under the cyber legislation, but across the board and look to see that privacy rights and civil liberties are not being abused. Until and unless the significant community in this country that worries about privacy rights and civil liberties is comforted that the government isn't doing bad things, 
until and unless the right and the left on this issue believe that the government is not doing bad things with regard to, to uh, snooping on them. We're not going to make progress on cybersecurity. Now, that may be illogical. Uh, it may be frustrating, but it's the truth. Until we make those people happy, uh, we're not going to make the kinds of progress we need to make on cyber defense measures in this country. The second of the three issues with regard to the legislative context is regulation. And here, Senator McCain does play a key role. Senator McCain uh, is having a, an interesting fight with his friend, Senator Lieberman. Uh, normally, those two guys line up uh, together on every issue, but they're having a, a public squabble on the issue of cybersecurity and regulation. Senator Lieberman is the co-sponsor of a bipartisan bill. Senator Collins is the other sponsor. Uh, of a bipartisan bill to improve cybersecurity on critical infrastructure. Critical infrastructure meaning the private sector industries, electric power, oil and gas, uh, banking and finance, transportation, the private sector industries that would be the targets uh, of cyber attacks. The Lieberman Collins bill proposes something that Senator McCain thinks is regulation. And Senator McCain, joined by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, oppose the bill because they oppose any new federal regulation almost whatsoever. There's some room for discussion, I think, about whether this is really regulation. What the Lieberman Collins bill says is that these target industries, the likely targets of cyber war, the critical infrastructure industries should get together in their verticals, electric power, oil and gas, transportation, get together and with a, an antitrust waiver should be able together to create best practices for cybersecurity. The government would then comment on them. And those best practices would then go into effect. And all the companies in those verticals, those industries, would have to, every year, be audited by a third party to see if they were living up to the best practices or not. Uh, and if they weren't, uh, and they're publicly traded companies, that information would have to be filed with the SEC. Now, the story ends there. It doesn't say the companies are going to be forced to do anything. They're not going to be forced under the legislation to live up to the best practices. They're not going to be fined if they don't. All that happens under this evil government regulation is that stockholders find out if their companies are living up to industry best practices. That's it. Now, if you think that's regulation, well, fine. I don't. And I don't think it's adequate. I don't think it begins to do what we need to do to force the industries on which we rely as a nation, our economy relies, and our defense systems rely, uh, to have adequate protection against cyber attack. But uh, there are those who think that's regulation. There are those who think federal regulation is ipso facto a bad idea, uh, and therefore Senator McCain and many others in the Congress are opposing uh, the Collins-Lieberman bill. The third issue that's emerged in the course of legislative review of all of these bills uh, is the role of the military in domestic protection. It's not quite posse comitatus, but it smells like it. And here, too, Senator McCain has played a prominent role. The legislation proposed by Senator Lieberman and Senator Collins put a lot of the mission of defending America's cyberspace inside the United States and working with those private sector companies, a lot of that mission in the hands of the Department of Homeland Security. 
What Senator McCain has said uh, is Department of Homeland Security can't even get uh, aviation security right. And he's conjured up images of long lines at airports uh, and people being felt up uh, by TSA agents and said, do you really want that department to be in charge of securing our networks? Well, you know, when you put it that way, it doesn't sound like a good idea. But the alternative, which he's promoting and others are promoting, is essentially to give to NSA and Cyber Command uh, the role of defending the private sector in the United States. This strikes me, this whole debate about what NSA and Cyber Command should do on the one hand uh, and what DHS should do on the other hand, strikes me as a completely artificial discussion. It's one government. And under the Economy Act and other provisions of law and executive order, departments and agencies can help each other. And they do all the time. If DHS is given the mission, because that will make it easier for private sector companies to deal with the government, and it will, trust me, there are a lot of companies that will not deal with NSA, rightly or wrongly. There are a lot of companies that, frankly, don't want to deal with the military, rightly or wrongly. Don't want them coming in and talking to them about their computers and their configuration of their networks. But there has been some building of trust with the Department of Homeland Security. Some people are able to separate in their minds uh, the fact that Homeland Security does TSA, also does Customs and Immigration, and now does uh, Network Defense. I would think that there's a model here a model that reaches back to another alumnus of this institution, and that's Admiral Rickover. There was a time when the only place you could find expertise in nuclear reactors in the United States was in the military, and largely in the Navy. But we didn't decide that we were going to have all the nuclear reactors around the United States run by the Navy. What we decided to do instead was to dual hat Admiral Rickover, to give him a civilian job at the same time he had the job of NR. And a lot of the people who then went to work in the nuclear power plants around the country were people who had retired from the military, who had been trained in the Rickover program. I think that's the way we ought to think about this issue. It is true that most of the expertise in cybersecurity in the United States is resident in NSA and Cybercom. Although there's a fair amount in the private sector. But in terms of dealing with the high level threat that is breaking through all of the systems that we now have, the real expertise is in Maryland. Fine. But let's not make that the grounds for imposing military control or military lead on defending America's private sector companies. Because, ladies and gentlemen, that won't wash. That will not go down. Just as privacy and civil liberties are a barrier, unless we deal with them properly, are a barrier to dealing successfully with cybersecurity, so too is imposing a military lead on defending the private sector and private companies. Let DHS be the happy face. Let DHS be the lead. And NSA and Cyber Command, under existing authorities, can provide them all the technical support they need. But if we continue this debate, if we continue this artificial distinction, the legislation won't move forward. We won't have new legislative authority to protect the likely targets of a cyber war. So what's interesting about those two examples of context, the cyberspace context and the legislative context, what I find interesting is 
you all are here today talking about ethics of cyber war. And largely that means, I think, looking at what you're going to talk about, the ethics of offense and the ethics of retaliation, which is kind of like offense. And yet, what I find the most important thing is defense. How do we defend this country? The primary job of government is to defend the nation. That's the first job of government. And as I said at the top, we do not have a plan today that you can take out and dust off to defend this country against major cyber attack. Luckily, I don't think major cyber attack is about to happen. But you never know. We do not have a plan today to defend this country against major cyber attack. We don't know who's in charge. We don't have the capability. We don't have the legal basis for doing it. And today, we could not do it. That I find disturbing. That is where I think our intellectual energy, our lobbying, our friends on, in Congress and in the administration should be focused. Because if countries like China can hack their way into every company in the United States, hack their way into the research and development arms of every major company in the United States. Think what they could do if they wanted to, to the power grid, to the pipelines, to the railroads, to the aviation industry, and worse yet, to the banking and finance industry. What makes cyber war and cyberspace different than all of the other domains that the military thinks about is this involvement of the civilian private sector. Now, you can say, well, in any war, uh, civilian things are targeted. That's true. And you can say, in the past, we've had to deal with issues about targeting civilians. That's true. But this is true on a much different order of magnitude. And when I hear the military talk about cyberspace, and say, ah, it's a new domain that we have to dominate. You know, I just, I'm struck by how organizations uh, always see things from their own perspective and not from the larger context. And if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. This is not a domain that we have to dominate as the military. Don't think about it that way. If you think about this as, it's like the sea, it's like the air, it's like outer space, one by one we create military organizations to dominate these domains. If you think about cyberspace that way, you're going to get it wrong. Yeah, it is, an or it is a space, a domain if you want to call it that, where militaries are beginning to conduct activities but it is unlike every other domain in the extent to which the targets, the expertise, and the necessary cooperation to defend this country involves civilians, civilian companies, multinational companies, civilian organizations. So in the course of your discussions over the next two days, I would urge you do not think about this as a purely military issue. Do not apply traditional military thought to this. Because if you do, I think we get it wrong. Yes, there's a role for the military here. And yes, there will be cyber wars. And yes, the military are going to have to contribute to the defense of this country. But they can't do it alone. And they probably, in terms of defense, can't even be the primary lead in doing it. We today have the greatest offensive capability in the world in cyberspace. And we like to revel in that fact. We always hear about China being able to break into networks. Don't hear about us. 
That's because we don't get caught. That's because we're a whole different class than the Chinese. But as good as we are at offense, we suck right now at defense. And as I drove past the, the stadium today on the way in, I thought, you know, how good would the middies be if all they did was put out the offensive line? And when it came time for the other team to play, they had no defense. That's where this country is today. And that's where I urge you to put your thoughts and attention. Thank you. Sir, would you be willing to take a couple of questions from the audience? Please feel free. There are, there are mics up there. Is that critical for them to be at the mics or if they can? OK, well, then I'd ask you to go up there if you, if you need to do that. George, go ahead. We'll have you start. Well, let me, let me answer the, the second question uh, about NATO, uh, because that's a very quick answer. Uh, and that is that NATO has already said, uh, North Atlantic Council has actually considered this issue. Uh, and NATO has already said that it will consider a cyber attack on any nation uh, as triggering the NATO commitment. Uh, so in the future, if Estonia is attacked, uh, since I think it's a member of NATO, um, if Estonia or any other NATO member is attacked, uh, that they can invoke uh, whatever it is, Article 3, uh, Article 5, um, which I think has only ever been invoked on September 11th. I think that was the only time it's ever been invoked by anybody. Um, and uh, the irony there was it was invoked in order to defend the United States, the only time in the decades of NATO history. Um, in terms of the larger issue of uh, is there a role for ethics and, and legal standards, I think there is a role for international arms control. Uh, and I went on in, in boring detail about that in one of the chapters in the book, uh, so I won't, I won't try to repeat all of that. But there are those who say that you can't do arms control on cyber war uh, because you can never verify it. Uh, and there are those who say you can't do cyber uh, war arms control because it's too complicated. All sorts of negative uh, initial thoughts about the concept of cyber war. And uh, I'm old enough to have heard them all before uh, about strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, when we started doing strategic nuclear weapon negotiations, people said the same thing. When we started doing conventional force uh, negotiations in Europe, conventional force arms control, people said the same thing. When we started doing chemical warfare arms control and biological warfare arms control, people said the same thing. Too complicated, can't verify, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we got agreements uh, on all of those things. We got SALT and START and CFE and the Chemical Weapons Convention and the Biological Weapons Convention. And I was involved in most of those, and it was hard. It took a long time. It took years and years. It created a little cottage industry because it took so long. 
the uh, negotiations on the conventional forces in Europe took so long that by the time the agreement was reached, there weren't any uh, because the Cold War had ended. But you know, you got to start somewhere, uh, and I, I really think that there are things you can do to make cyber war amenable to some aspects of arms control. I think you could create a, uh, a center for risk reduction, the way we created a center for risk reduction for nuclear war, uh, international center for exchanging information in real time, for seeking assistance in real time. I think the attribution problem, which everybody talks about, and I know you're going to talk about, I think the attribution problem is vastly overrated. Um, and I, I see some nods around the room, probably from people who have uh, code word clearances and know that it is vastly overrated. Um, so I, I think you could do it. I think you could do arms control. And I think, uh, in fact, the, the, the legal community creating standards, international standards uh, in arms control is important. I think creating international standards in the World uh, Trade Organization for industrial espionage uh, would be extremely important. Uh, that obligations that the governments would take on to enforce activity from within their country. Because you're, what you're going to hear is, oh, it's not us uh, that's doing it. Uh, I, one of the companies that was hacked last year, the CEO went to China afterward and met with Chinese government officials. And they said to him, uh, this is a quote, um, there are 530 million Chinese online. Why do you think the government hacked you? It could have been anyone from China. And he said, yeah, I know it could have been anyone, but I'll tell you specifically who it was. And he went on to describe an organization otherwise known as the People's Liberation Army. But uh, uh, I think having standards and obligations within the WTO uh, framework that are explicit, because right now they're not on this issue, uh, would, be, would be helpful. So I think there's, there are at least two areas of international law in the WTO and in arms control, where it would be helpful. Sir. Apropos of your comment about civil liberties and, and privacy, understanding your, your, your comments about uh, there being uh, politics to be overcome, if you strip away the politics of it, which I, I understand you can't, do you think there's a substantive conflict between those two that, you're, that we're going to have to give up as a nation uh, some, some degree of, of privacy and civil liberties in order to achieve the kind of robust cybersecurity posture that we would like? No. No, I don't. Uh, I, I, I think there are protections that can be built in. Uh, you know, we're, this is not about reading your email. Uh, and when we talk in the DIB pilot and, and elsewhere uh, about scanning uh, network traffic, what we're doing is looking at the packet level uh, for signatures, uh, known signatures, uh, and doing that with, uh, with technology that doesn't introduce latency. That's going to be a problem uh, as speeds increase. Uh, but right now, it's possible to look at the packet level of uh, things going over networks for known signatures of attacks uh, and not introduce latency, not look at the content uh, of email. Uh, and it's possible to strip off uh, the personal identifiable information. Uh, I don't think it should, by any means, introduce problems. In fact, I don't think you get privacy uh, without cybersecurity. I think the greatest threat to privacy online is the absence of cybersecurity. You know, every day I get stories and all the, all the news feeds I get and the blogs I get, every day I get stories about privacy information being stolen. You know, this company today, that company tomorrow. Uh, and the reason that those privacy information, medical records, have been stolen a lot lately, the reason that that privacy information is stolen is the absence of cybersecurity. So I don't think there's a contradiction between privacy and civil liberties on the one hand and security on the other, I think you don't get one without the other. Sir. I want to return to the DHS-NSA debate. Uh, after a 
I watched a testy exchange between General Alexander and Senator McCain. That was funny, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Well, not for General Alexander, maybe. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, those of you who haven't seen it, essentially, uh, Senator McCain browbeat uh, General Alexander about DHS issues. But after that exchange, I looked up DHS's budget, and about three-fourths of it was devoted to TSA, the Coast Guard, and immigration. And I looked at that, and I thought, well, that's not the kind of agency. That's not the kind of level of expertise. And then I thought of the budget realities, that they're not going to probably get the tens of billions of dollars that would be necessary. And recruiting personnel would be horrendously difficult because they'd, they'd essentially be trying to recruit from the private sector who would pay a lot more than they used to. So in terms of institutional realities, we have those people in NSA, and most of them are in NSA, mm -hmm. and we're not going to get them anywhere else very soon. So what would you say about that? I agree with all that. <laughs> Remember, what I'm saying is that the department that has the legal lead, the department that has the high-level people meeting with industry, the department that is running the NKIC today, the National Cyber Center, uh, should be DHS. I say that because I've spent a lot of time going around this country talking to CEOs and talking to industry associations and talking to universities and talking to labs and they are not going to cooperate with NSA if they think it's NSA. If you can have NKIC out in Arlington, you know, in, in Boston, part of the uh, Department of Homeland Security, if you can have the, the people, and by the way, they are recruiting. They're recruiting pretty well. Uh, and they do have budget authority for recruiting. But if you can have the organization look civilian, uh, and to some extent be civilian and have the legal authorities be given to a civilian department, then under the Economy Act uh, and under executive order, uh, all the people at NSA can support it. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that you can't replicate NSA, that it's a national asset, uh, it's a global asset, and it, 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 these skills are rare, uh, the very good skills are rare. Uh, fine. Why I think this is an artificial argument, uh, why I found the, the, the argument to, between McCain and, and uh, Alexander to be funny, uh, is it's really an artificial argument. You can have everything that Senator McCain would want, and by the way, everything that Senator General Alexander would want, because General Alexander actually agrees with Senator McCain, despite the fact he couldn't say that. Um, you can have all of that and still have civilian control. Not a problem. You don't have to change the budgets. You don't have to replicate NSA. Uh, you just put DHS legally in charge. Thank you, Mr. Clark, for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Galker. I'm actually an NSA employee. and. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm what you said, that uh, NSA and DHS collaborate in a tremendous uh, amount of effort behind the scenes. It's not overtly there, but uh, just to piggyback on exactly what you said, uh, the authorities are there for NSA to do the technical support, and that does happen to a tremendous level behind the scenes without folks knowing about it. That's not what my question is about, though. Um, well, uh, thank, you for the, thank you for the corroboration. <laughs> Um, you, you had mentioned uh, that you thought no one was in charge of cybersecurity. Uh, my question to you is, uh, theoretically, the Obama administration put Howard Schmidt in charge of cybersecurity. I was wondering, I don't know if we're in a non-attribution mode or not here today, but I was wondering if, if you could comment on that position and his effectiveness and if there's any hope for that model. Well, Howard, who is a dear friend of mine, um, Howard is not in charge of cybersecurity, and, and he wouldn't say he is. If you look at the executive orders that, that create his position, uh, they tell you what he can't do. Uh, and as somebody who spent over a decade in the White House being a coordinator, uh, I know that departments uh, and agencies of government are very insistent on telling you what you as a White House staff person 
can't do. You can't uh, direct people. Uh, you're, you don't have line authority. You don't have legal authority. The departments and agencies and the secretaries uh, of the departments have the legal constituted authority. Uh, and it, therefore, what Howard is, is an advisor uh, to the cabinet, to the president on cybersecurity. Uh, I've never really understood why people object to uh, the White House having operational authority. Uh, nobody seemed to object to John Brennan having operational authority going after bin Laden. Um, but very, very frequently uh, when the White House uh, takes authority uh, away, leadership authority away from departments and agencies, you get all this ranting about how the White House shouldn't have uh, operational authority, and the last time anybody did it was Ollie North, and you know, it all went to hell. And, and, and I was sitting, you know, getting this complaint all the time. I was sitting in Ollie North's old office, so I was very sensitive to that criticism. But I, I took the plate off the fireplace once to see if there was any money left behind. But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, there wasn't. Yes, sir. This will be the last question. Jeff McCausland with the Army War College. Thank you for some terrific remarks. Uh, I liked your chew, but obviously those things overlap, and I want to press you mm. a bit on one it's of a, them. It's a Venn diagram. Yeah. yeah no, um, no. And that, of course, is the hackism and, and WikiLeaks. And we're about to have a, a trial. So somebody's actually going to be tried for a crime, which is good old Bri uh, Bradley Manning. So my mm. question to you is, one is, are you convinced that this one single guy was responsible for all this, or will this trial perhaps reveal a, a broader a broader, a broader effort, which included hackism on a larger scale, that actually then might bring more and more criminal charges. Good question. Yeah, now, Chu is actually a Venn diagram, but to, to demonstrate that, I would have to use PowerPoint, and that's against my principles. <laughs> <laughs> or a grease pencil, but I don't have a window. Um, I think the trial will show that Private Manning was alone in downloading all of that information. Uh, but what bothers me is, and he should be on trial, and he should go away forever. Um, but what bothers me is he's the only one on trial, not because he's the only one that stole things, but be th because I think there was criminal negligence in the command. Um, I do not believe that any military command these days could be as lax as that. Uh, without some criminal negligence. Um, they saw this guy coming in day after day with disks, and they saw him downloading things. Uh, and they took his excuse that he was downloading Lady Gaga m music, um, or copying his Lady Gaga tapes for his friends. Um, I'm led to believe that the command had a software license uh, for uh, a widely used program in the government and in the military to notice insider anomalous activity. Uh, because there is a major threat you know, from insider activity downloading information. Uh, and for years, for years, uh, software has been available in the government to notice that kind of activity. And that software would have picked up Manning's activity. Uh, I'm told, and I don't know this is true from first-hand experience, but I'm told the command had the license for that software and had never installed it. Uh, I think we need to have standards of accountability uh, in government, both civilian and military, on cybersecurity, such that when you are in command of an organization, civilian or military, and it doesn't have the essential minimum cyber defenses in place, you ought to be held liable. And when your negligence results in the compromise of thousands of classified documents and the burning of sources around the world, you ought to be held criminally accountable. <coughs> Well, we're off to a great start with the scene being set uh, of what will be discussed, some challenges our way, some very thoughtful comments that we'll have much to chew on. We want to thank you, sir, for coming.
but also for your many years of service to our uh, to our nation. Thank you, sir.